This is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Yeah. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. It's about trout. Wild trout. This is Trout Bitten. This is the Trout Bitten Podcast, and thanks for tuning in. My name is Dominic Swintoski. I'm the owner of Trout Bitten and the author of TroutBitten.com. All right, this is episode two of our Dry Dropper Skills Series. So we're prepped and ready to talk about light dry dropper. We're breaking things down into the key components and then going deeper into the weeds on the specifics of how it's all put together. Remember that this season of the Trout Bitten Podcast is a skills series of connected episodes. In episode one, we set up how and why we use dry dropper and we did an overview of all three styles. And now, my friend Austin is here to help cover light dry dropper. Here he is, Austin Dando, muscle man, young love, <laughs> rock climber, surfer. What did I miss? Anything else? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what else are you? <clears throat> Husband. Ocean elitist. <laughs> Worker of wood. Want to be brewer of beer. <laughs> ah, yes. Brewer, <laughs> brewer of beer. Drinker of beer. Yes, indeed. That's the easy part. <laughs> what are you brewing right now? I haven't decided. I, uh, you got something in bottles, though, don't you, right now? Yeah, I have a session pale ale in bottles right now. See? It's a good summer beer, about 4.3%. Um, all Cascade hops. I've got mm. Cascade hops on the vine right now. I'm growing, uh, growing hops at home. I'm getting ready to pick those and dry them in the... Hopefully do a beer with those. Well, that's slick. I didn't know you yeah. could grow hops. You know, I don't know. This is how dumb I am. I didn't know you could grow <laughs> hops in PA. Yeah. Some of them are more uh, tolerant of our conditions in like out in mm. Yakima Valley um, where a majority of hops are grown. But yeah, things like Cascade and Centennials are, are pretty um, cooperative yeah. for the amount of sun and rain we get. So yeah, they're, they've taken off really well. It's the first year they've been in the ground and I've got a lot of cones on the vine ready to be picked. Ah, that's neat. Yeah. What's the real citrusy hop? Citra. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what it's called? <laughs> yeah, that would be the main one. Um, Citra, Mosaic, Amarillo are uh, kind of ah. three heavy hitters. They call them yeah. cheater hops because they uh, they just make beer taste good. I've heard of all those. Yeah, they're so uh, pungent. Yep. I've read the cans. <laughs> yeah, they're on the cans, baby. I can read the cans. <laughs> that's what I can do. That's cool. Yep. Going to get a trout bitten beer going someday. Hey now. We'll branch off. That's the next branch of Troutbitten. Troutbitten Brewing Company has a pretty good sound of the name. It does. Troutbitten is <laughs> a good name. It is a good name. It is. It's just a good word. You should use that. We sh somebody should use that. <laughs> <laughs> I did trademark it. So everybody yep. out there, don't even think about it. <laughs> it's true. That was my wife's idea was to trademark it. I said, ah, it's not going to matter. But this was like a couple years into the business. It wasn't yeah. even a business then. She's like, you should right. trademark that. And I said, ah, to spend the money to trade, you need a lawyer and all that. But mm -hmm. anyway, it was definitely the right move. Yeah, no doubt. Good call, Becky. All right, we better get serious. Remember, these are compact, tidy episodes. Nobody wants to hear us talk about beer. <laughs> we got that new trail ad, though. Do you hear the new trail ad? New trail ad is good. I love that. Pretty excited orange, about that. Orange can, baby. Orange can. Orange can. That says it right on there. It got citra in there. It does. Yeah, the uh, the ruby red grapefruit. Ruby red. That's <laughs> a good visual. That's that's good imagery. <laughs> it is. It is. Anyway, I'm excited to be working with those guys because it seriously is our favorite beer. Yeah, that's what we had when we went on that last trip together. <laughs> we just got a cooler full of the orange cans. Yep, we've done that a couple times now. I love it. Okay, I did something in the first episode that I'd like to do again. I'm going to read an excerpt from the Dry Dropper Styles series that I published on Trout Bitten a couple of years ago. These podcasts now provide an excellent companion for that work, and I'm excited to bring a little more detail to the topic with these conversations. All right, this quick story is from the introductory paragraphs of the article covering Light Dry Dropper. Here we go. My buddy Steve hates nymphing. More accurately, he's not any good at fishing subsurface because he's never learned the ins and outs of the whole thing. But Steve will drop a dry fly on a dime at 50 feet in the wind, and he'll build enough slack into the leader using crisp, precise aerial mends, landing a 50-foot cast with the slack in all the right places, 
and getting a 20-foot drift across multiple current seams. Remember that last part for later. So I felt kind of bad as Steve approached from upstream. I was fighting another good trout, and the rod bounced and throbbed in my hands. The fish surged when Steve watched, hands on his hips. Did I ever tell you I hate nymphs? Steve asked. Yeah, I think you've told me a few times, I said. Pulling with hard side pressure on the wild trout, my fish moved over into the slack water near the bank, where it promptly swam towards Steve. Standing in calf-deep water, he swiftly unhooked his net and nonchalantly swept my trout through the hoop. But Steve never stopped talking. I mean, all these caddis and the sulfurs, look at them. Steve gestured into the air with his right hand, holding hemostats to remove my fly. There have to be... Steve interrupted himself and looked at the trout in his left hand. Hey, that's a really nice fish, Dom. Yeah, you know what he ate? I asked. Steve slid the brown trout back in the water and held up the hemostats with my fly in the metal jaws. Sulfur nymph, he said with a scowl. I smiled back. Yep. I reeled in some line after Steve threw my nymph back into the river. He muttered a bit and then said to me, You know, I did tie a nymph on behind the drive for a while, a couple hours ago, up beyond those hemlocks. Steve motioned upstream. And? I asked. And it destroyed my whole drift, Steve said angrily. I didn't even like fishing anymore. That's what always happens when I fish dry dropper stuff. I paused before I started casting again. Then I finished out the seam I was working on. But in a couple minutes, Steve was still standing there as if his last statement required a response. So I paused again and turned to Steve. Were you fishing the dry or the nymph? I asked. What's that mean? Steve said. With the dry dropper, were you trying to get good drifts on the dry fly or the nymph? I used my hand to signal a high or low position. Both, I guess, Steve replied. Well, you can't fish both. I shrugged. You have to pick one or the other. I think you'd really like fishing light dry dropper. What the hell does that even mean, Dom? Steve asked. I waited over to Steve and I reached into my vest for a pre-rigged leader section. It means you'll fish the dry fly, I told him. And I grabbed his leader to tie a few knots. So that's a true story that gets to the heart of the key points here about light dry dropper style. Like you said in the last episode, Austin, one of the flies, one of the flies, the dryer or the nymph, is always in the driver's seat, while the other is kind of along for the ride. And for this light dry dropper style, it's definitely the dry fly in charge, right? Yeah, absolutely. When we're fishing this style, it, it feels like we're fishing a regular dry fly setup. It should, yeah. If we find ourselves trying to fish this style, or if we find ourselves fishing dry dropper and my dry fly keeps sinking all the time and I can't get a good drift on it and yeah. I'm getting frustrated. You know, we're probably not doing a light dry dropper or maybe any of the other styles very well. Yeah, for sure. The, this adding the nymph here should not affect the cast. It's light enough. The nymph is light enough that it doesn't affect the cast. We're going to get into the details here in a moment. Yep. Um, and therefore, it does not take away the effectiveness of that dry fly. You should get just as many eats, well, almost, as many eats on the dry fly as you were already getting when you add the nymph. But hopefully now, you know, you get twice as many because, and maybe three times as many because now there's something underneath. That's why we're adding it. Yeah. Because they should eat it underneath. If you have no belief that they're going to eat that nymph underneath, of course you're not going to attach it. Right. And oftentimes they do. It makes logical yeah. sense too. If, if we're fishing a dry fly maybe as our primary fly, it's probably... Because there are fish coming up to eat. Yeah. And uh, that's what we want to focus on. So if there's fish moving towards the surface, that means they're also looking at emerging insects also headed for towards sure. the surface. Right so on. if they're on their way up already, it's not going to be something out of the ordinary for them to see, you know, a light hackled nymph hanging eight inches below uh, right. the surface of the water. So yeah, of course they eat that too. Yeah. And I find quite often some of the better fish are the ones that just aren't willing to come clear to the surface. Mm. They're a little more wary. And yeah, nice. plenty of times they will come all the way up and just whack whatever dry fly you have. But plenty of times they're a little more wary. They will eat something that's riding 10 or 12 inches mm -hmm. below the surface, which is what we're trying to do here. With this light dry dropper setup, we're not trying to get real deep. Good point. Another thing is that no special dry fly is really needed. You know, we don't need some super buoyant fly because boy, all we are doing is adding a very light 
nymph. We'll get into the details here in a second. No leader or rig change is really necessary. We're just adding a light nymph after it. And overall, there's just minimal impact on that whole, I don't know, that whole experience of fishing a dry fly. You know, right. in my story, right? That's why Steve would like it. And yeah. he does. Yeah, it still feels pretty pure and, uh, you yeah. know, to the, to the root of fishing a dry still. Yeah, and yet they often eat that nymph, mm-hmm. you know? It's light enough that it doesn't affect the cast and you still have that experience and yet, boy, that dry goes under and it wasn't a fish that ate it. <laughs> so yeah. you're setting the hook. Hey, there we go. Wow, that's, it's like magic. They, I didn't <laughs> even works. see them eat, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So we should run through what light dry dropper style really is. You know, light dry dropper is a dry fly rig with the addition of a very light nymph or a little soft tackle or something similar in behind it. Mm -hmm. We said in the uh, overview, five centigrams or less. If you don't have a gram scale, seriously, buy a gram scale. They're like 20 bucks, you know, and you can learn so much by just weighing things. If you're into nymphing at all or the streamer game at all, I mean, if you ever put split shot, Split shot, shot on your line or beads on a hook. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Buy a gram scale and see what things actually weigh. You will be ah, so enlightened by by weighing leader sections and weighing what those beads actually weigh instead of what the package says they weigh. <laughs> and, you know, but anyway, five centigrams or less. It's almost just the the weight of the hook. That's about all right. it is. Right. Um, that nymph has dropped about ten inches to. Mm, 30 inches, three feet at the most for me. Uh, beyond, you ever run it longer than that? Longer than like three feet back? Not for not for this style, no. Right. Yeah. Because again, we're not trying to reach the bottom and past that, I feel like I'm just creating a, a veil of drag behind right. the, the dry fly more or less. I so I you. try to keep it a little more tidy and, and close. Yeah. With such a light fly, too much mm-hmm. slack can build up. A veil. <laughs> that's neat. Yeah, right? that's yeah. how I picture it. Right. And we're not trying to reach the bottom. So I, yeah. I'm not, I don't need to add, you know, four feet to get down to that, you know, two and a half feet of depth. Um, this exactly. light dry dropper style is not about trying to feed trout that are glued to the bottom. Nope. Yep. It's about, like you said, trout that are willing to come up through and eat something off the surface, but then maybe the shy ones are just underneath. Yeah. Where do you think your nymph is riding? Like if you had to pinpoint it average. I don't know. Give me an average. Mm -hmm. Like how many inches below the surface? Um, Inches. Well, I'd I'd say it's in the first third of the column towards the top. Yeah. And it depends on how fast the water is moving and how deep the water is. But I don't know. I feel feel like I reach a steady state. I'm probably foot and a half under. Oh, really? Yeah. If that, maybe. I don't think I'm very deep. Don't you hate it when people ask you those kind of questions? <laughs> like you said, there's oh, so many the variables. <laughs> no, really, there's a lot of variables. Yeah, but if you cast into a fast riffle yeah. and you have, let's say, 18 inches of mm-hmm. tippet on behind you, you may hardly scratch the right. surface by the time you right. pull that dry out. Right, right, right. And today I was fishing water that was calf deep, for real, calf yeah. deep. <laughs> and that's some deeper stuff around here right now. Right. Yeah, for some That's of the stuff true. I've been fishing. I said before, I've been challenging myself with really skinny water just to see what I can make make happen. Yep. And anyway, calf deep water. So I was running my light dry dropper only 12 inches back. I would say if I had to average it out, oh, six inches deep, four, six, maybe eight inches down. Yeah. That's it. Yep. And that makes sense for that scenario. Sure does. I mean, what are you going to do? Why would you make it any deeper than that? It wouldn't make any sense. Right. And when You'd I did, just be on bottom the whole time, right? When I did, I mean, I actually, I actually changed the tippet uh, to about two feet at one point, and then I was just bottom, bottom. Yeah. Even, even with this really light pheasant tail that I was using, no weight, just the weight of the hook, mm-hmm. and that pheasant tail was still getting down. You know, yep. If given just, oh, I don't know, given ten feet to drift, it would find the bottom in that yeah. calf deep water. It makes sense. Yep, especially when if there's slack when the The nymph lands, I mean, that's where it's going to go. Regardless of how heavy or or light it is, it's going to go down there. Yeah, if there's any slack, like you said, if you permit any slack, which is what we usually do want to do, allow Mm -hmm. it a little bit of grace to fall. Mm -hmm. Precision Fly and Tackle is a family-owned business with a passion for the outdoors and a sense of adventure. They are anglers who enjoy every moment spent on the water with family and friends. 
Precision Fly and Tackle carries the widest selection of Euro rods, reels, lines, leaders, flies, and accessories. From the beginner to the advanced angler, Precision Fly and Tackle can outfit every angler, no matter the budget. Visit them online at precisionflyandtackle.com. Then use code TROUTBITTEN10, that's the number 10, for 10% off your order. Gear up with Precision Fly and Tackle for your next adventure. Whether it's after a fishing trip or at a backyard fire, you can bet the Trout Bitten crew has a case of new trail broken heels along with us. It's honestly our favorite beer. This hazy IPA is smooth and full-bodied. Hand-selected citra hops lead to notes of bright clementine and juicy ruby red grapefruit. Broken Heels is a keeper. New Trail Beer is proudly brewed in Williamsport, Pennsylvania and delivered cold to your favorite craft beer retailer every week. At New Trail, it's not about being the best angler. It's about getting out there. So enjoy nature's moments and reward yourself for a day well fished with New Trail Broken Heels. It's Trout Bitten's favorite beer. Hey, another thing about this style is the dry fly can be whatever the trout want to eat. I don't need to run any special dry fly. True. Um, and likewise, I'll run whatever nymph I think that they're going to eat. Again, though, it can't be too big. You know, if mm -hmm. I feel like they're eating size 12 stone flies, this is not the style. <laughs> right. Even if you keep the weight out of a size 12 stone fly, if you had no lead wraps and if you had no bead, not even a brass bead, you can't get it light enough because there's water weight that will take away, well, it'll take away your light dry dropper style and kind of force you into the standard dry dropper style. Even the water weight of a nymph that's too big for this, it just destroys that dry fly drift. Absolutely. And then you get into the, uh, the frustrations of, oh, my dry fly sinking. This, I can't figure this out. And often it is, it's just right hitting the right balance. So I often mm. fish things that are you know, 16 to 18 to 20. That's kind of my sweet spot for this style. And, yeah. you know, there's no bead on them. Um, if there is, it might be a brass or a, a glass bead. Yeah. Um, some I like to fish midges off the back of them, for example. Right on. Or, um, very lightly dubbed uh, waltz worms or something like that is another sure. one I like to do. But nothing too complicated. It's often small, simple patterns with no built-in weight and often, you know, materials that won't hold a lot of weight. Yeah. I tried fishing a crest bug yesterday because crest bugs are pretty darn good in the summertime mm -hmm. around here. Oh, yeah. But even a size 16, and then I even went down to an 18 crest bug, which for me is just dubbing on a hook with uh, yep. maybe a scud back sometimes. Right. Yep. It was too heavy. <laughs> Sounds funny to say that that's heavy. But it was the, <laughs> again, it was the water weight that would just kind of pull the slack out like we've talked yeah. about. We're going to talk about rigs in a minute. But yeah, it was forcing me into that standard style of dry dropper that I didn't really yep. want to be into. And it was interesting. And as I knew we were going to do this dry dropper series, yeah, I've been focusing a lot on, well, yeah, the last few days, especially the light dry dropper. And I was just kind of chuckling. I was like, nope, that crest bug won't really work here. <laughs> Different kind of crest bug, sure. But not the way I tie mine. Regardless of kind of, uh, did you shorten your tippet section or anything like that? Yeah. Or it got uh, too that, short that it was just silly or what? No, that wouldn't that wouldn't change it. It was just the weight of the crest, oh. uh, the weight of the water inside the crest bog. Once it was wet, that would pull the slack out of my dry fly leader. That was it, oh, and I it see. wasn't even by much, not even by much, but it did change things. And I don't want it to change things, right? <laughs> With this light dry dropper style, I want to feel like I'm fishing dry flies. So like right. you said, the WD-40, the, the zebra midge with a glass bead, soft tackles, really small pheasant tails. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. really care for a waltz worm because again, it's it's dubbing on a hook. A little mm -hmm. pertagon can work. Boy, with a brass bead though, not a tungsten one, usually. I use an RS-2 a lot. Yeah. That, especially with its uh, little CDC puff in there, right. it almost holds itself back. It has exactly. no weight. Yeah, it, can, and, it does. Right. That's a neat fly to do with this style because it's so light and it'll, it'll get under the surface. You can fish an RS2 on the top if you dress it, you know, if you put mm -hmm. a little bit of uh, desiccant on it. But I fish my RS2s as nymphs almost always. And that's a good one. And <laughs> they eat it a lot. Yeah. I like that fly. Yeah, it would resist kind of that, that dropping mm -hmm. because of mm -hmm. how it's built with that material resistance that's in there. That's a good idea. Yeah. And a lot of this too 
If it's riding four, six, eight, ten, maybe twelve inches underneath the surface, it's kind of in that well emerger range, mm -hmm. right? It's right where emerging insects are going to be, well, just about to emerge. And trout that are in that target zone, yeah, they should be convinced if you have a great presentation. Like you said, I like the nymphs no larger really than a sixteen. Honestly, I mean it, no larger yeah. than a sixteen. Yeah. Usually eighteens, often twenties for me. I rarely nymph with anything less than a 20, but that's for around here because I don't need to. I know there are tailwaters and other places where people are nymphing with 22s. Go ahead. That'd be a great thing to do with this light dry dropper. Yeah. So those are the nymphs. Let's talk too about the rig just a little bit more. I know that you and I both use a Harvey leader for our yeah. yep. dry fly presentations, right? Yep, I do. Yeah. And you're not changing that to do the light dry dropper? No, there's no need to. Um, again, the way it's built and the way we fish this, it's going to feel and should feel just like a regular dry fly cast. So that yeah. uh, in turn allows you to use a regular dry fly leader like the Harvey. Yeah. And once I'm getting good drifts on the dry, that's when I'll add a nymph. Nice. So this morning, yeah, I started out like right at dawn. I was proud of myself. I got up <laughs> early enough to actually be on the water at dawn. And I started by nymphing because honestly, the dry fly fishing hasn't really picked up until about eight o'clock, eight thirty, or even nine o'clock each morning. It's been kind of neat. When you're out there every day, you can really see the patterns, you know. Right. I don't know. When I wanted to change over, I fished terrestrials. I fished a little ant, tried to really jam it up against the banks. That was fun. Yep. Uh that is only fun. got a couple hits. Didn't actually get any takes. I don't know if I missed the missed the hook set. Really I think they were just kind of slashing at it. I figured, all right, let's add that nymph. And I did. I put that RS2 on. Ended up catching three, maybe in 30 minutes. Had a That's couple cool. other looks. Might have missed a strike or two. Um, but the point is, before I added that nymph, I made sure that my leader was built and ready for getting great drifts on the dry. And that in itself is a whole skill. <laughs> right. Right. And we're talking about using this Harvey leader, but whatever fly you attach, you need to adjust the tippet section to match that dry fly. You got any words on that? Yeah, that's a great point. You know, when we fish a, let's say a parachute Adams, um, a size 16, and we want to go ahead and switch over to an elk care caddis size 12 or something, yeah. you know, that terminal tippet area of that uh, length of 5X or whatever it may be, is not going to perform the same way as it does no. on the lighter, less air resistant dry fly. You know, you may need yeah. to choke up on that 5X or, you know, remove some of that 5X and build out your 4X section and stiffen up the butt end of that. Mm. Um, and it's it really, once you tie, like you said, tie your knots, it doesn't take long to do. But uh, it is important to start with that baseline and kind of choose the dry. And then after that, move on to the nymph. Yeah, because you have to get great drifts with that dry fly to expect that your nymph, your added nymph, with this light dry dropper is going to get a great drift too. Yeah. yeah. That in itself, we should do a full skill series on, well, dry flies, but especially on how to adjust your tippet section and maybe your whole leader to get those S curves that we really need. And yeah, that'd be that's, great. Yeah, I, that's a good idea. I love that whole topic. It's not just the air resistance or the size. It's not, not just the numbers, not just because it's a number 12 versus a number 18. And it's not just the air resistance, it's also the water that is held by the materials. And boy, it took me nice. decades to understand that. My favorite parachute ant, for example, the way I build it, that um, back bulb of dubbing mm -hmm. holds yep. quite a bit of water, and <laughs> relatively speaking. <laughs> <laughs> but it adds some weight that, again, sort of pulls. And even like a size... 18 is not necessarily well matched with 6x, 5x goes better. <laughs> anyway, there's a lot to talk about there. Uh, I have some stuff on the website, but we should definitely do a full skills series or talk about it with all the guys because yeah. how you get those good. dry fly drifts, yeah, is very important. Again, if you're going to expect to get good drifts then when you add the nymph. All right, so you're adding your nymph now. You, mm -hmm. you get great mm -hmm. drifts with the dry, now you're going to yep. add the nymph. Um, how do you add it? From the bend of the hook? Or the eye, you throw it on a tag. What do you do? For this style, I do like to just throw it off the bend. Yeah. Um, I don't really like adding tags onto my Harvey leader. If Agreed. I can avoid that, I, I try not to do that. Since it is a, a very light 
nymph that's going off. I don't feel like I uh, I get a bad kilter or, or tilt off of the dry fly when I add mm. that uh, knot on to the bend. Sure. And I just use a simple clinch knot. Um, I feel like that's the easiest for me. It's the fastest, quickest. Right. I use a clinch or a davy. Yeah, what do you do? Yeah, I usually come off the bend. Sometimes I come out of the eye. Um, yeah. That is when my dry fly is a barbless hook. I'll bring that up. If you tie okay. off the bend of a barbless hook, it'll slide off. When you, <laughs> That's worth mentioning. Yeah, when you least yeah, expect it. Our buddy Sloop is the one who pointed that out to me. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Sloop makes it to the podcast again. He does. <laughs> Here he is in season four. <laughs> he needs to be a guest. He does. Slooper. Yeah. Um, seriously, uh, he pointed that out and I was like, huh, yeah, you're right. It won't slide off for a day sometimes. And then you'll have it slide mm-hmm. off three or four times in one day. Yeah. And there's almost no Trying to figure out it. why. Yeah. 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 That's why. So careful with those barbless hooks. Um, you can add it onto the bend, but in that case, I usually go back out of the eye. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to be honest, that's exactly the reason that most of my dry flies are not on barbless hooks. I pinch the barb down, but that just still that little nub that's left there right. after you pinch the barb down sort of just keeps your added on line for the nymph. It just keeps it from sliding off. Yeah. I remember Sloop Hughes talking about this one time. He's like, yeah. why don't they ever sell these check nymphs in the fly shops with barbs on them? I like when I can crush them down and I can get that bump. All these barbless yeah. looks, they don't have any bumps in them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> check nymphs. He thought that, he thought the, yeah, the check nymphs. He <laughs> thought that bump was what the, the holding power. You know, he, he was losing out on holding power without his crushed ah, barb. I love it. Yeah. That's a thing too. Hey, do you use uh, fluorocarbon for the added online? Yeah. Yep, I do. Are you on nylon? For added online, any anytime I'm drifting underneath, I, I usually have fluorocarbon on. Yeah, that's me so, too. Not a whole lot different there. I do think it sinks better. I believe what they say when they tell you that the trout don't see it as much. But for me, it's, it's about it sinking better. All right, so we mentioned this a little bit, how to get good drifts on a dry fly. Right. And there's a lot of material on trout pitting, many articles on this topic, you know, how to adjust a Harvey leader, how to adjust any dry fly leader. But real quick, you know, how do you get good drifts that are drag free? I mean, because that's our baseline. Drag free drifts on a dry fly is what we need, right? But how do you get those? It all starts with good casting principles and practicing that casting and getting a repetitive motion and, and feeling confident in that the right leader of course, helps a lot too. You know, if, mm-hmm. if you have the right casting stroke, but your leader is built backwards, you're not <laughs> going to feel any success. That's true. And also going along with that leader, a tippet section that matches the dry. So yeah. the suppleness of that terminal uh, leader there should also match the action of the dry fly that you're intending to fish. Sure. So if you want to fish something that's really delicate, say like a size 18 olive, you shouldn't have a uh, an ending section of three X. It's not going to, it's not going to act <laughs> natural. Right. right? Yeah. Um, but if you're fishing like a, a size six hopper out West and you're mm. trying to cast it with a five X, it's going to twist in circles all day long. Right. You, it's going to twist. It won't turn things stiff. over. Right. Um, so you have to match them. And all the things you just said there, like the casting, having the right leader, and especially that right tippet section. I mean, if you get it all right, especially that casting, you can create these S curves in the line. Mm. It looks sloppy yep. when it lands. That's what I tell people. <laughs> They'll say, oh, it didn't land straight. No, we good. We don't want it to be straight. As soon as a leader lands straight on the water with a dry fly out there, it's going to drag. If you have any cross currents at all, it's going to drag. We don't want it straight. We want S curves. Again, it'll look sloppy. Right. Um, S curves and kind of swirls. That's fantastic. And then, of course, those swirls and S curves are taken out by the currents and eventually... Mm-hmm. The dry fly, well, uh, starts to move, starts to slide and, and go across those currents and drag. Yeah, and, right. And then things are usually over for us. Yeah. And I think, you know, we often want to uh, land that dry fly straight, maybe because it's like the furthest distance you can reach with that leader. That's true. And when we land with slack, it feels like, ah, I didn't really reach my target or I didn't really right. reach the potential of this cast. But that's not the point. You know, we can always take a step closer and reach a little bit further. But those S-curves, as you mentioned, they may look sloppy or like they're not on purpose, but mm-hmm. they are. What you said about the distance there is a real mental challenge. <laughs> we, we experience that when we're nymphing too with a tuck cast mm-hmm. because the tuck cast, just like getting these S-curves, uh, takes away some of your distance. But like you said, you can take a step closer or you yeah. can let more line out 
And right. I, but whatever, there are ways to adjust for it. But it is a mental challenge to, <laughs> to go, all right, I need to allow for this. I have to allow for these S curves. You can be deadly accurate with all these S curves. Honestly, like the story I read from the beginning, my buddy Steve is fantastic at that. He will yeah. put all those S curves and oh, just aerial mens and curves in just the right way, laying everything down, compensating for this fast current and then the one next <laughs> to it. And he'll get these fantastic drifts coming downstream that are long in in complex yeah, that's so impressive uh, among complex current scenes yeah it is yeah. when you see somebody do that it mm -hmm. is impressive mm -hmm. so i guess the point that we have here is that, that this light dry dropper style allows us to still do all of that and then that rs2 <laughs> or that wd40 or that zebra midge or soft tackle something small something light is now along for the ride and it doesn't take away those S curves or that slack, that that grace to that drive fly is still there. You know, that's good. Right on. Tactical Fly Fisher was started in 2015 by fly fishing team USA angler Devin Olson with a mission to bring American anglers the techniques and gear that dominate the international competitive fly fishing scene. While you may have no desire to compete, you can still benefit from the same strategies which competitive anglers use to make them more successful on the water. Whether you want to buy a urine nymphing rod, a stillwater fly line, or just some hooks and beads to fill your fly box, we've got you covered. And our teaching materials will help you learn how to use whatever products fill up your cart. Head on over to the tacticalflyfisher.com and use the code TFF10 to get 10% off flies, fly tying supplies, or terminal tackle. For over a decade, Smith Creek has provided innovative, high-quality fly fishing accessories designed to put your gear in easy reach, free up your hands, and keep our waters clean. This September, Smith Creek is releasing two new products. Check their website to see the new tippet holder. Each unit is individually machined from high-quality billet aluminum and anodized in one of two eye-catching colors. They hold up to five tippet spools with a patented spring-loaded plunger design that is easy to load and keeps your spools right where you need them. All Smith Creek products are built guide tough and backed by solid customer service. To learn more about Smith Creek products, visit their website at smithcreek.co. So by just adding this very light nymph, none of what we're talking about changes. None of that dry fly experience changes. And I will say for the first time here that there's a bit of wiggle room in between these three styles. For example, if I do add a beadhead nymph or I use, let's say, about 10 centigrams of weight, then it does affect the cast a bit. I experienced that this morning, later in the morning. I added, oh, a brass bead pheasant tail because I knew I needed to get deeper. The trout just mm -hmm. were not coming up mid-column. Now I was fishing knee-deep water. And the, even the brass bead, it probably weighed about eight or nine centigrams. And at that point, I might even cut back then on the tippet length to the dry or even tighten that up with some thicker tip. Yeah. It'd be hard for me to say this morning that I was, when, when I did that, that I was fishing standard dry dropper <laughs> because I, eh, I almost wasn't, but I kind of was. Again, there, there's, there's some crossover. Absolutely. There's lots of crossover between these styles. And this morning when I did that, I wasn't quite fishing this pure light dry dropper style because the nymph that I chose to put on did affect the drift. You know, but then I dealt with it. But was I clear into the standard style? Probably not. You know, so anyway, there's a lot of in between uh, crossover wiggle room there, you know. Yeah. And that's, I think that's another great point to bring it up again is that you realized it was happening and you didn't try to force, you know, your own agenda, your own rig over conditions that weren't going to allow it. Yeah. And when you know something like that's happening, like you said, it was taking my <laughs> S curves out. Yep. And then I could, okay, now I need to either adjust my cast, which I did, or mm -hmm. I could have mended once it was on the water. If I'm mending, then I really do feel like I'm fishing that standard style, which again, that'll yeah. be episode three. It's next week and we'll cover the standard or bobber dry dropper. But let's just remember here, it, this is a dry fly method. This light dry dropper is a dry fly method. It's an enjoyable way to give trout a second option without sacrificing much of that dry fly experience like my buddy Steve likes so much. Remember, like his aerial men's, um, they were crisp and precise rod movements, and that's what he enjoys more than anything. He doesn't like nymphing. 
But boy, he likes catching three, four, five, ten extra fish in a morning, mm-hmm. you know. But it doesn't take out his S curves or adding that nymph doesn't take away his ability to be very artful with the dry fly. Uh, and I know that's why he likes it. That's why I love it. That's why so many of us love this light dry dropper. Sounds great, right? So <laughs> we should definitely address though a couple downsides, right? Yeah, right. For me, one thing that I notice is sometimes the accuracy can, um, yeah, accuracy that we're used to on a, a solely dry fly rig can sometimes change when we add oh, yeah. the extra variable to the back end. So it requires a little bit more uh, finesse to get it to mm. do exactly as you would like as mm-hmm. if you were just fishing a regular dry. Yeah, that's why it's not great, I don't think, for terrestrial fishing. When I want to fish yeah. an ant, which I do a lot here in the summer, I like to be jammed up against the bank. I mean, mm-hmm. inches, two inches off the bank. I'm not kidding. That's, right. those, I get excited about those casts when I go, ooh, I put it just inches <laughs> against that log, you know. And if I add, well, this RS2, 12 inches back, well, now it would be over that log or onto that grassy bank, the RS2 yep. would. Yep. I don't want that. And yet, right. like you said, the accuracy suffers. You can be very deliberate about where your dry fly is going to go, but you really don't have that much control over the placement of that nymph. And often what I've seen is that nymph is so small that I I can't really see its entry very well. I don't see a splash. Yeah, we're so used to seeing two entry points when we're fishing a a double rig. And you almost have to sort of imagine it a little bit. Sure. The only time you sometimes you get a, a clue is if uh, it does kick over and grab that branch or it grabs that yeah. piece of grass and maybe yeah. we give it a slight tug and it drops in and we rem- yeah. you know, go into the drift. But yeah, that's a real challenge. That, that's a key point here because we don't have perfect accuracy over, especially the nymph, where the nymph is going to land. Often the nymph will land in a different seam, a seam that is moving faster or slower than the dry fly. And now you have two flies in two different seams. <laughs> And this is a very important point. Dead drifts happen when flies travel down just one seam. And I, man, I mean, I talk about that all the time. I've written probably a dozen mm-hmm. articles on trout bitten around that theme, around that idea. That's where good things happen. Dead drifts happen in one seam. But with a dry fly in one seam and the nymph landing in, I don't know, another seam that's gone faster or slower, then you have two flies that will kind of fight each other a little bit. Sometimes you can even see it. You can see the dry fly, I don't know, pulling right. away from you. And you go, well, why is yep. that happening? Sidestepping a little bit. Yeah, so I, I like that, sidestepping. And, and maybe it's happening a lot, depending on the water type. But it might be drastic or it could just be very, be very subtle. With the light dry dropper, it is usually pretty subtle. Yeah. But again, you have, if you have two flies and two different seams, you're not going to get as pure of a drift. And really... I think that's why when I do add that nymph, almost always the production of my dry fly goes down. Even though this whole episode, this whole podcast here, we've been saying like, oh, it doesn't affect the dry fly. You still get your dry fly experience. (laughs) Right. And yet, yet, (laughs) there's a caveat. There is. My production goes down a little bit on that dry fly. I think that's why. I think it's being pulled slightly toward the nymph. Right. Mm. It changes things a little bit. And we talk about too, you know, we're, we're most in touch with the thing that's the heaviest on our rig. Uh, and good point. when, you know, we are fishing uh, a nymph rig and we have our point fly on the bottom as the heaviest fly, you know, we can kind of boss that around and put it where we want. And mm. the, the tag fly, not always, but somewhat has to follow suit a little bit, depending on yeah. our cast. When we're fishing a, a dry fly and a really small unweighted nymph, really the thing we're in touch with the whole time is going to be the dry fly. Mm-hmm. And that nymph kind of is at the mercy of whatever the last action the dry fly entered the water with. Let's say the dry mm-hmm. fly entered exactly how we wanted it, but because of how it entered for some unknown reason to us, it kicked the, dry, the nymph off to the left. Mm-hmm. Right. It happens so easily because that's what we're in touch it with. Does. And the nymph is kind of on its own rogue path, hoping it lands where <laughs> we want it to. Yeah. That's why strike detection is not nearly as good on this style as it can be, well, with the tight line dry dropper style, for example, that, that third style that we're going to get to. 
um, tight line dry dropper, you can often feel the hits through the dry fly. You'll feel right. them hit the nymph, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and it will not happen with this light dry dropper style because you're not in touch with that nymph. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it, well, it can kind of be in the whole radius. If you're 12 inches back, then it could be, what, 24 inches away from the, uh, well, right. help me out here, science. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Trevor when you need him? What's There's the 24 inches of range, basically. I'm trying to say, <laughs> right? It could be 20. It could be 12 inches to the left of the dry. It could be yes. 12 inches to the right of the dry. Two feet. You know, two if feet. we divide 24 by 12, <laughs> we get two. That's two feet. <laughs> okay. How do you like me now, Trevor? How do you like me now? <laughs> <laughs> but those two flies being two different seams is an important point to understand for sure. You know, and you, you want to try to control that. But as we said, a lot of times you can't even see the entry, especially in, I don't know, broken water. It's very difficult to see the entry of that light nymph. Yeah, yeah. But if you can, and if you can feel like you're in control of it, then man, try to give it, get them in one seam. Try to get everything in one seam, and then you have a much better chance of, well, everything drifting how it should, especially mm -hmm. if you're going for a, a dead drift, which yeah. is your baseline. We've kind of touched on this too, but... Because of uh, the situations we find ourselves fishing this most often is typically sometimes lower, clear conditions. Um, yeah, yeah. And when it is that way, trout can often be pretty weary and spooky of, of things landing from above, let alone two things coming from above. Good. So point. that may be yeah. another uh, downside or disadvantage is if the, the trout are extra spooked that morning or for whatever reason, those two, uh, two entry points may put them down. Yeah. That's a good point. And you brought up water conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. You're right. I do fish it most. I fish light dry dropper most in lower water conditions. I fish it in all conditions. Well, not mm -hmm. muddy water very often. But yeah. th again, though, I mean, you could have, I don't know, higher water conditions and they're coming up for a sulfur hatch. Right. And I kind of want to put uh, the dry fly on a surface. That's great. They're eating it. Okay. But then maybe they're not eating it quite as much or I start to see swirls just underneath. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic mm -hmm. time for me to add a nymph that's, uh, again, small enough that it's not going to affect things. But for me to run this light dry dropper, as we just discussed, and just get a nymph that's running four, six, eight, or 10 inches below the surface yeah. um, and get those trout that are just kind of swirling near the surface that's a lot of fun usually in that case i'd probably run a i don't know soft tackle pheasant tail yep that is a lot of fun anything else austin did i get you with no words of wisdom this time <laughs> i was going to talk about water types <laughs> were you <laughs> i jumped the gun on myself anything else dominic <laughs> 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 do you have anything seriously yeah i think i i just touch on your story that you opened with you know if you're a, a dry hmm. fly only angler or you know you get your biggest kicks out of dry fly fishing and you sure. find yourself in a day that is not going your way and your buddy downstream is is wailing them on nymphs yeah. but you don't want to succumb to it <laughs> light dry yeah. dropper is a, a great way to get in the game there and, and still enjoy the <laughs> the casting and uh, the whole thing it is I love fishing dries, and when I do, I kind of get committed to it, mm -hmm. especially if I get a few fish on, you know, on the dries, or if I'm getting refusals, I'm always thinking like, oh, I can get them, I can get them, I can change this dry or change the water type that I'm casting into, <laughs> and so I get very committed to the dries sometimes, just like, you know, the dries only guys, and yeah, <laughs> it's almost like cheating. <laughs> you know you're like yeah i'll be throwing rs2 back there often they'll hit it two or three or four to one they'll keep eating that nymph eating that nymph eating that nymph and then once in a while they'll still eat your dry fly well you could cut more if you really wanted to if i wanted to right if we wanted to we could have caught as many as we wanted <laughs> <laughs> that's austin's thing so Fishing a nymph under a dry fly is rarely as simple as just adding that nymph and casting it out there. Some forethought into what your objectives truly are, measured against your options for rigging and fly selection, goes a long way toward filling the net with trout. Do you want to fish the nymph or the dry? That's the question to ask. 
Of course, each style allows for the opportunity to catch trout on both flies, but only the light dry dropper style is tuned for fishing the dry fly at its best. While standard dry dropper and tightline dry dropper are great for fishing the nymph first, light dry dropper is perfect for offering the dry fly as a primary choice. And sometimes, the frequency of takes on the added nymph is stunning. Hey, I want to thank you all so much for listening, for your support, and for making this Trout Pitten podcast so successful. Sincere thanks go out to our show sponsors as well. Next up is a breakdown of the standard dry dropper style. And just like this light dry dropper, there are a lot of nuances to cover, strengths to recognize, and weaknesses to overcome in the most common of styles, standard dry dropper. So look for that one in your podcast feed. All right, Austin, will you read us out? Remember, the Trout Bitten Project is a free resource for all anglers. The Trout Bitten website posts over 900 articles with endless stories, commentaries, tactics, tips, and more. Find what you like through the top menu and through the search page. Navigate by way of the categories and the tags, too. Be sure to find the Trout Bitten YouTube channel, currently featuring the Trout Bitten Tips series and an ongoing series about fly fishing the mono rig. These videos are short, useful, and unique tips for your fly fishing life. Thank you for listening to the Trout Bitten Podcast. Please give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and leave a comment because that really helps us out. Until next time, friends, fish hard, enjoy the day, and find your life on the water. My mouth can't stay wet enough, and I'm not allowed to chew gum anymore. Nice. I got in trouble for that. Look at me! Well, you could have cut more if you really wanted to. Nope. Yep. Nope. Yep. Nope. Yep. Nope. Yep.